Good morning, church. How we doing? Good to see everybody. Hey, we're about to just jump right in. We're in a series called All In. All In. It's all about going all in with Jesus, giving him every part of us. And so many of the songs we were singing this morning, we're just uh, following after that same theme. Um, I want us to begin by praying together. Um, And if you're going to take notes today, and if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Uh, And we're going to be looking at uh, a story um, of Jesus, of restoring this man. And uh, we're going to, for the very first week of this series, um, I want us to, before before I I pray, um, I want us to, again, read a verse together. Mark chapter 8. This is really the theme verse for, for this whole series. Mark chapter chapter 8 verse 34 and uh, we're going to read this together and this is what it says it says if anyone wants to be my follower he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me Uh, we learned last week that in order to go all in with jesus we have to dethrone ourselves and we have to enthrone jesus we have to um, determine that we're not going to try to be in control of our own lives. Instead, we're going to give our entire lives, everything that we have, to Jesus and go all in with Him. Over the next weeks, we're going to be talking about some specific areas in our life where Jesus calls us to go all in. Now, these aren't the only areas in which He calls us to go all in, but there are some big ones. There's some huge ones. And today, um, we, we began by reading the Great Commission. Um, and that is the marching orders for, for every single disciple of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important than that call that Jesus gave us to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded and that Jesus is with us to the end of the age. And so today we're going to be talking about one of our core commitments here at, at at church, and if you notice, we have the the posters, and it's find. We often say that found people find people, and so today we're going to be talking about evangelism and how essential it is. How this is one of the areas that, if we're really serious about going all in with Jesus, we have to be serious about evangelism, serious about about sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus with the people that are in our lives. And so I want us to pray together and then we're going to read in in Mark uh, and we're going to begin reading together. So um, let's pray. God, we believe that your word is true, that your word is living, that it's effective, that it's enduring, and that every every part of it is has been given so that we can know you better, so that we can grow and become more like you. So God, we ask that today that you would just soften the soil of our hearts so that you can plant your word deeply within it. I pray that your your word would be planted so deeply within us and that good growth and good fruit would come out of our lives as we receive your word and as we seek to put into practice. God, um, we desire not just simply to be hearers of the word, but we desire to be doers of the word. So God, I pray that Um, We would do much more than just listen, but God, that we would be fully obedient to you. God, I pray for, um, God, I pray for every person that's in here today. Uh, God, I just want to praise you for those that went all in with you last week, that just dedicated their lives to you for the very first time. God, I I thank you for those that chose to, um, just to uh, reaffirm um, their uh, that they're all in with you. And God, I pray that that would continue to happen today. Uh, God, I pray that we would have a passion for your mission, a passion to see people that are far from you um, be connected to new life in you. And to that end, God, I pray that as I, as I preach today, um, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you'll help me to just to preach with passion, uh, to preach um, in, in a way that is understandable. And I pray that I would only say the things that you would have me to say. And uh, God, to those ends, we just ask that you would be glorified and honored. We pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to, to give you the big idea for, for the day. Um, it's really going to serve as the pattern for our whole message, and, and I put it in one sentence, and here it is. When the lost become the found, the found become the finders. When the lost become the found, the found become 
the finders. And now this is going to make a lot more sense to you as we jump in into our story today. We're in Mark chapter 5 and uh, this is the story of what's just happened. Jesus um, and his disciples were um, out on the sea and it got rough and Jesus was sleeping and his disciples were fearful and they woke Jesus up and Jesus speaks and the sea goes calm. And his disciples are absolutely amazed at this. And they said, who is this that even the the, the seas and the weather, they obey him, uh, you know, that they obey him. And so um, this amazing how Jesus had just, just spoke and the weather itself obeyed him. His disciples are amazed. And now they're about to be amazed again as Jesus is about to do something that no one had been able to do um, before this. So Mark chapter 5. Um, so they just hit the shore and this is what we're told. Now the big, the big point, this part, the part of the story is we're going to see that when the lost become the found. We're going to see someone that was lost and then Jesus comes to find them. Um, we're, we're told that Jesus comes to this shore, and by the end of the story, um, he comes, does his work, and then leaves. So Jesus came over to this part simply to find and to change one man's life. And you're going to see um, how, how he does that. So Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat... A man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. Now I'm just going to stop right here. That I, I don't know about you, but if all of a sudden I saw somebody running out of a graveyard, out of the tombs to me, I would be maybe a little bit concerned, right? Um, if they're hanging out. And we're, we're going to see that there's a lot of things about this man, a lot of things about his life that um, are, are quite concerning. So... Um, He wasn't just hanging out there. The tombs were his home. Verse 3. He lived in the tombs. No one was able to restrain him anymore, even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but had snapped off the chains and smashed the shackles. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. It's kind of a big deal, isn't it? I mean, so you've got this guy that he, he chooses to make his home um, within the tombs, within the graveyard. Um, apparently, he was kind of a wild and crazy guy. They tried to subdue him. They put chains on him, but he broke the chains. That's pretty amazing. Verse 5. And always, night and day, he was crying out amongst the tombs and in the mountains, cutting himself with stones. Now, Luke's gospel also recounts this same story, and Luke also tells us that this dude is naked. So, so you've got a naked guy living in tombs, cutting himself, being able to break chains. That, this is a pretty strange circumstance, wouldn't you say? So, watch what happens. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, He ran and knelt down before him, and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, this is Jesus, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. All right, so the the condition of this man, what we're going to see in just a moment, that that he is a man that's been possessed by demonic spirits. He has unclean spirits that are within him. And and, and this idea of unclean, it's, I want you to understand, this man was, was lost. That's one of the analogies that the Bible uses for our spiritual condition is lost. But another way that it talks about it is being lost also has to do with being unclean. Now let me explain what unclean means. Unclean has to do with the idea of lacking holiness, um, lacking being set apart. Let me read you out of the Old Testament, out of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10 says this, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean. So as you see, the idea of being holy and clean or being or being um, common and unclean. So 
back in this, there are all these laws back in the, in the Old Testament that, that determined whether something was holy and set apart or whether it was unclean. And if something was unclean, then, then it was separated from God. It couldn't be used in the service of God. Um, it was unholy. I want to give you just one other verse because what we're going to see is that this man was, was totally unclean, ritually um, ritually unclean. He, he cuts himself. He lives in tombs. And, and here's why, here, before I read this verse, here's why this is important. Most of us don't, can't relate to this guy's story. I mean, how many of you have ever made your home in a graveyard? Anybody? Any, any graveyard livers? Nope, no, none of us. Um, most of us don't have the power to, uh, to break chains. Uh, we don't run around naked cutting ourselves. And, and so we might look at this story and say, how, how in the world does this have to do with me? How does this have to do with the idea of, uh, of being lost and found? Well, what I want you to see is that this man, the physical things that are happening to him are a picture of the spiritual condition of people that are lost and broken. So, so this man, physically the things that are happening to him, um, this idea of being unclean, of being lost, that that's the same that's true for all of us. So he is a picture of what it means to be someone that is, is taken over by sin, that they are separated from God, that they're unclean. And so uh, Leviticus 13, 45 through 46, this is what it says. This is just one of the laws about being unclean. It says, the person afflicted with an infectious disease is to have his clothes torn, his hair hanging loose, he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. And he will remain unclean as long as he has the infection. He is unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. Now, this man's condition really does seem to fit that, doesn't it? He's living alone. He's outside. He's separated. And the reason is, is because he's unclean. He's separated from God. Now, we're going to go on in this story in just a moment and learn a little bit more about why he's unclean. But I want us to see that the Bible speaks of all of our conditions and every single person that's ever lived, that our condition before God is one of being unclean apart from Jesus. Isaiah 64 says this, you welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you and your ways, but we have sinned and you are angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something, what's it say? Unclean. And all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. Isaiah is reflecting on the fact that, that God, God welcomes those that do what's right. But the truth is all of us have done things that are wrong. All of us have been in this spiritual condition of being lost and unclean and 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 because of that we need an encounter with God we need an encounter with Jesus Christ every single person that you encounter needs to needs to know Jesus they need to be changed by Jesus and so Jesus comes he he crosses over the sea simply to set this man free so let, let's follow on Mark chapter 5 verses 19 through 17 what is your name he asked him, my name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. Now what you're going to see is Jesus is actually having a conversation with this demon that's inside this man. Verse 11, I mean verse 10, and he kept begging him not to send them out of the region. Now a large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. And the demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. And he gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits came out and entered the pig, the pigs, and the herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. Now I want to just stop right there. There were over 2,000 pigs, and that's how many demons at least were inside this man. So he was a man that had been overtaken, that his whole life had been, had been ruled. And, and scripture talks about that even if, ever, even if you don't have a demon inside you, scripture says that our sin has separated us from God, that we are, 
are being ruled by the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan himself, apart from Christ. Now, so these, Jesus allows these unclean spirits. Now, I want y'all to notice this. Did y'all notice how they couldn't do anything without, without Jesus' permission? Jesus had absolute authority over them and that none of them could have done anything apart from, from Jesus allowing them. So Jesus allows them to go into these pigs and then the herd, they rush down the steep bank and they drown there. I, I think this is the interesting thing for us to see is these demons, what did they ultimately do to the pigs? They killed them, right? And ultimately Satan came to do what? To steal to kill and to destroy, but Jesus has come to do what? Give people life. And so when we go into the world, when we look out into the world, when we see people that are lost and far from God, we need to know that they're under the bondage of sin and Satan wants nothing more than to destroy their lives so that, so that the life that God created them to have, that they won't experience. But Jesus has come to set people free. And we're going to see in a minute that he has called us to be the messengers that, that call people to be set free. So, here's what happens. Verse 14. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside, and people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed by the legion sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Now you might ask, why were they afraid? Because Jesus was able to do something in this man's life that no one else had been able to do. And they didn't know what to think about Jesus. Who is this man that, that was able to just, just a word to free this man? To, to change him from being a guy that was cutting himself, living in tombs, naked, to now sitting there in his right mind, back to his normal state, the state that God had created him to be in. And so, after they saw him, it says they were afraid. Verse 16, the eyewitnesses described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. And then they began to beg him to leave their region. Now, I think that's an interesting part of that story, don't you? That Jesus had just done this miraculous thing, but now they want Jesus to leave. They don't want Jesus to be there. Now this is where the story really changes. This, this first part is when the lost become found. When the, clean, uh, the unclean becomes clean. That's what's happened to this man. Now I want you to put yourself in the place of, the, of, of this man. How do you think he's feeling at this moment right now sitting with Jesus? I mean, don't you think that he's absolutely overwhelmed and amazed at what Jesus has done in his life? I mean, it's got to be like the most freeing thing in the world to, to know that you're, you're back, to, back to normal. And for those of you that experience salvation in Jesus Christ, isn't it the most incredible thing to know that you're forgiven and set free? It's the most incredible thing to know that, that now that you're no longer bound to the power of sin in your life. That now you've broken free from the power of sin. And now you, you don't have to continue to live in unrighteousness. That now you can live the right way. You can live as God's called us to live. Because he set us free. He's given us life. He's broken the power of Satan uh, in, in our lives. That's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Now, if you're here today and, and you've been set free, if you, if you know that, that, that life-changing life uh, message of Jesus, if you've encountered that in your life, this next part is really where I want you to key in. Because this is so vital. Psalm 51.7 says this. It says, Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be Wider than stow. The psalmist is calling for God to be the one that cleanses them. Isn't it good news to know that God cleanses us from all unrighteousness? That no matter what our sins are, no matter how, how deep and how dark, that it doesn't matter what we've done or where we've been, that God says, you are clean in my sight. That's the good news uh, of the gospel. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says this, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, 
and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, notice this, from how much sin? All sin. This is the most beautiful truth that I think that we could ever know. That Jesus Christ, that he cleanses us, not just from some sin, but every single sin. He cleanses us from the sins of the past, the present, and the future. So that when God looks at us, he says, you are free and you are forgiven in Jesus Christ. That is, that is the most incredible news. And how did it happen? It took the sacrifice of Jesus. Now Jesus came to this man and he just spoke a word and that demon went out. But we know that ultimately that, that the forgiveness that needed to happen, that the freedom that needed to happen, that it took Jesus' blood. It took Jesus living the perfect life dying the death that we deserved, and then rising again, showing that he had power over even death itself. That's, that's what it took in order to cleanse us from sin. But notice what it says in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are doing what? Deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So, so that means that there's no person in this world that can ever say, I don't sin. I've never sinned. If we say that, then we're deceived. Then, then, and the truth is not in us. The truth that we're all sinners needing to be saved by the grace of God. But verse 9, look at this great promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what's just happened to this man in this story. He's just been cleansed and set free by Jesus Christ. When the lost become found, now here's what I want you to see. The found become the finders. The found become those that begin to tell other people about Jesus. Just as Jesus made this journey to come and encounter this one man, Jesus now is going to call for, for this man to go and do the same thing for other people. And if you're a follower of Christ today, you need to know that Jesus, if you have been lost and now you've been found, he now calls you to be a finder. So let's read this together. Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. As he was getting into the boat... See, I love that, that Jesus came just for this man. Isn't that amazing? He said, I'm just going to make this journey just for this one man. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed kept begging him to be with him. Now, doesn't that kind of make sense? I, I want you to think about this. Why do you think that this man so desperately wanted to go and be with Jesus? I mean, it could be because he was a little bit you know, concerned about, about how people in his region would still view him. Does anybody ever have that, that issue that maybe before you knew Christ, the life that you lived, that now you look back at that and you regret that life that you lived? You regret some of the things that you did. And there's so many people that when they think of you, they think of the old you, right? And, and so I imagine this man, part of the reason he wanted to go with Jesus is he wanted a new start. He said, you know, I, I just want to go where nobody knows me. I want to get a new start. I want, to, I, d I want to do that. I think that's part of the reason he asked to go with Jesus. I think, number two, that he just simply wanted to spend more time with Jesus. Wouldn't you, the man that had just spoken and freed you and did for you what no one else could do, that you just want to be with him, right? I mean, how many of us right now, if somebody said, hey, you could go um, uh, you, hang out with Jesus, wouldn't you want to jump at that opportunity? just to be able to sit and hang out and talk with Jesus, to be with him, to learn more. I think that's the natural, the natural inclination of all of us. We come to know Jesus, we want to know more about him. But I want you to notice what Jesus does. Verse 19, but he would not let him. Instead, he told him, go back home to your own people and report how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Just stop right there for a second. Jesus says, I know you might think that you want a, a fresh start. You might want to go where nobody knows your background. Where when they think of you, that, that what comes to their mind is that crazy guy that ran around naked, cutting himself, screaming at night. 
I know that, I know that you want to go with me, but I actually want you to go back home. I want you to go back to the very people that knew the old you so that you can tell them about the new you. And I think this is exactly what Jesus called us to do, is often we're, we're fearful about interacting and going back to the very people that we used to be with that knew the old us. But Jesus tells this man, I want you to go back. For what purpose? I want you to go back and report how much the Lord has done for you. Now, I, I want to know how many of you that know Jesus today, how, how many of you could say the Lord has done much for you? How many of you can say that, that he's had mercy on you, that, that his mercies are new every single day? And how many of you know some people that need to hear about that same mercy? They need to hear about that, that same grace that you experienced. Now, verse 20, notice what happens. So he went out, and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and they were all, what? Amazed. I love this. I love this part of the story. Because notice what the man didn't do. I think often we get caught up with uh, making excuses for why we don't want to tell people about Jesus. There was a, a survey um, that I read, Lifeway, Lifeway um, did a, basically um, a little survey with people. And uh, 80% of people that attend church at least once a month believe that it's our personal responsibility to share about Jesus with other people. 80%. Now, um, I would hope that 100% would believe that it's our personal responsibility to share with people about Jesus. But you know what was really interesting is the next statistic. It said that 60% of people that believe that had never shared with someone oh, within the last six months. They had never shared with anybody about Jesus. So 80% of people believe it's our personal responsibility, but out of that 80%, 60% had never actually done it. Now, if we're taking that statistic right here, what, what that means is that maybe some of you, maybe 80% of us in this room believe it's our personal responsibility to share with people about Jesus, but the vast majority of us just haven't done it. And that's really the challenge for today. The challenge is, is that if you are lost and became found, Jesus now calls you to go out and be the finder. Jesus, his, his commission, the last words that he gave to us were to go and to make disciples. And, and if we are truly going to be spiritually mature people that go all in with Jesus, we've got to go all in by being willing to tell other people about Jesus no matter what. We've got to be willing to, to speak about Jesus. We've got to care enough about people's spiritual conditions to go to them. Jesus cared enough about this man's spiritual condition that, that he, he traveled just to come and meet him. I, I'm curious of who it is in your life that, that you're willing and that you care enough about their spiritual condition that you're willing to have maybe a conversation that's a little more uncomfortable where you're asking them about their relationship with Jesus. You ask them, say, hey, I'm, I'm just curious. If right now, if you just, you know, stepped into eternity, if you died today, do you know where you would, you would end up? How many of you have ever just had that conversation with someone? Just look at someone and say, I, I'm, I'm curious. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are, are you, would you be willing just to do that? Because that's exactly what this man does. He, said, he goes out and he begins to proclaim. Notice the excuses he didn't make. He didn't say, well, I need to learn more about Jesus before I do this. I think that's often it. Is we think that we gotta, we've got to wait till we become this super spiritually mature Christian. How long had this guy been a believer? Like, moments, right? Moments. And, and he went out. And, and here, here's what you need to know. Is if you, have, if you have encountered the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are equipped to tell other people about it. Plain and simple. If, if you have experienced what it's like to be set free from sin, if you know that it's only by faith in what Jesus Christ did, that he lived the life that you did not live, a sinless life, 
that, that God demanded absolute perfection, that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus came to die in our place, to take our punishment and to rise again. And by faith in that, you could be saved and set free from your sins. It's really that simple. That's how simple the message is. The message of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want you to know this. When Jesus finds us and changes us, we are no longer the focus of the mission. We are now the missionaries. When Jesus finds us, we are no longer the focus of the mission. We are now the missionaries. Jesus said he came to do what? To seek and to save the lost. That means that before you knew Jesus, but while you were lost, you were the focus of the mission. You are the focus of making disciples. But as soon as you, you move from death to life, as soon as you go from being unclean to clean, as soon as Jesus makes you new, you, you've switched sides. You're no longer the one that's the focus of the mission. You're the one that's carrying out the mission to other people. That's the reason that, that, that this whole big idea, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And when the lost become found, the found become the finders. In that way, it's not about me and you anymore. It's about the people that are like the old me. The people that are still lost. And, and that means that, that our focus now is, n is not on ourselves and what we can receive from Jesus. Because Jesus says, no, I, you're not going to go and be with me. I've got a mission for you. I'm going to send you right out. Now I want you to see what happens as a result of one man. Now Jesus leaves this area and at this point, we only know of one person that's a follower of Jesus. It's this used-to-be demon-possessed man that's been changed by Jesus. And he goes out, and he's obedient to Jesus. A couple of chapters later, a little time later in Jesus' ministry, Jesus returns back to this area. And notice what happens. Mark chapter 6, verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gesenerat. And beached the boat. And as they got out of the boat, people immediately recognized him. How'd they recognize him? Well, some of them might have seen him the first time he came, but you know, one of the reasons I believe they recognized Jesus is because there had been somebody telling about Jesus, that there had been somebody proclaiming about Jesus, about who he is and what he's done. Verse 55. They hurried throughout the vicinity and began to carry the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. That's a big change from what happened the first time, isn't it? Jesus, we want you to leave. Please leave this area. Now, they can't wait for him to be here. Why? Because there's been one guy that got so passionate about being changed by Jesus that he began to spread that news everywhere, and now that whole region has changed so that now they don't want Jesus to leave. They can't wait to be with Jesus. It's absolutely amazing. Verse 56, And whenever he would go into villages, towns, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him, that they might touch just the tassel of his robe. And everyone who touched it was made well. There, uh, throughout this story, the idea of begging has happened. Remember, the demons begged Jesus not to send them out. Then they begged Jesus to let them go into the demons. Then the man begged, begged Jesus to go with them. And then the people begged Jesus to leave. Now the people are begging for Jesus to come and to be with them so that he can heal them. Jesus' ministry of casting out demons, of healing the sick, all of these things were, were uh, physical pictures of what, what God came to do, to set the captives free. Because ultimately, all sickness, all demons, all these things are rooted in the fact that, that their sin entered into the world, right? And Jesus came so that he could eradicate those things, so that he could set people free. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think right now, who is it in your life that needs to be set free by Jesus? If you've got a piece of paper right now, I want you to write their name down. Who's that person that you don't, you don't know about their spiritual condition? You have no idea. And you know what? We can't be content Simply knowing that we've been made right with Jesus, we've got to be passionate about, about making sure that other people are right with Jesus. And as a church, 
Imagine what could happen. That happened with one person that got passionate about sharing about Jesus. What would happen if every single person that's in this room got passionate about sharing about Jesus? How different would our community look if that happened? How different would your workplace look? How, how different would, would just this whole area of Virginia? Do you, think, do you think a revival could start if we really got passionate about sharing about Jesus with people that were far from God? Absolutely. Now, here, here, here's the truth. If you're a part of that, that, that percent that believes it, it's your personal responsibility, but you haven't taken the opportunity to do it, the st- first step I believe we need to take is we just need to confess to Jesus that we've been out of line with, with what his great commission for us was. I think we just need to be able to say, Jesus, you called me to, to make disciples. You called me to, to share my faith with people, and I just haven't done that. And, and Jesus, I repent of that. I, I, I think that's where we have to start, isn't it? The church has to repent to say, Jesus, we haven't fully obeyed you like, like we should. And so for some of you here today, that's maybe the exact place you need to be, is you just need to say, Jesus, I'm sorry I haven't carried out your mission this way. I haven't went all in. And then would you today make the commitment to say, God, um, I, want to, I want to be someone that finds people. Just like Jesus came and found me. I want to be someone that, that carries the message uh, of Jesus to other people so that they can be changed, so their life can be radically changed both now and forever. Let's just bow our heads right here together, if we could. I'm just going to give you an opportunity just to spend a little time with the Lord in prayer. Maybe you're here today and, and maybe you've never experienced that new life in Jesus. Maybe you're like that, that man that your, your life is, is broken, that it's unclean, that you're, you're not holy and that you need Jesus to set you free. I just want to let you know that, that Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to, uh, to free people from sin and death. And this morning, you can receive that forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Scripture says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. So maybe you're here today and you just need to call on the name of Jesus. That just as that man physically was set free, that you need to be spiritually set free by Jesus Christ. If that's you, I'm just going to invite you in just a moment uh, just to pray and just to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, I just want to pray with you right now. Lord Jesus, we confess that we're, we're sinners and we're far from you. We confess that we need you. God, I believe that you sent Jesus to, to forgive us and to set, set us free from our sin and death. And I receive Jesus today as my Lord and Savior I believe he's the only one that can change me from the inside out. I believe he's the only one that can make me clean. And I believe by the blood of Jesus that I can be washed clean from all my unrighteousness and have a right relationship with you. By faith, I receive Christ today as my Savior. God, I just want to pray for those that have just just prayed that prayer. I pray that... Uh, this will be the, the beautiful start of them going all in with you. And just like that, that demoniac man, that now they'll turn right around and they'll share that good news with someone. They'll share that good news with someone close to them that you have set them free. Pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Still with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you're someone that you were lost but you've been found by Jesus. Maybe you've known Jesus for a short time or maybe you've known him for a long time. But today, he's just revealed to you that he wants you to be a lot more active and passionate about reaching people that are far from him, sharing the good news of Jesus. I just want to pray for you today. Jesus, I pray for those that are believers in you, that you will free our lips to be able to speak about you, that we will care about the spiritual condition of people around us, that we will be evangelists, that we will share about all that you've done in our lives 
God, that we will share about the good news that Jesus came to live and to die and to rise again for sinners. God, to that end, I pray for this church. I pray for every single person here that we would be absolutely passionate about carrying the gospel to people. God, this week, give us opportunity. Just as Paul prayed in Colossians 4, open doors of opportunity so that we can boldly share the message. God, give us those opportunities this week and help us to walk into them. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you would, just stand to your feet this morning. We're going to sing a song. We're going to end with worship. Let me just give you a word. If you need to pray with someone this morning, if you came to faith in Christ this morning or last week and you haven't let anybody know about that, we have some people at the back that would love to to be able to talk with you to celebrate. If you have any prayer requests, if there's a person that's on your heart and mind, let me just open that up. If you want to come down and pray, maybe you've got a lost person in your life you want to pray for today, I invite you, come down here to the front. Come and pray. Uh, cry out over them that God will give you the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with them. To that end, let's just celebrate, let's worship, and let's respond to him this morning.